Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Bethlehem Lutheran Church and a very special welcome to any guests who may be in worship today with us for the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. Today's liturgy is Divine Service 1, which is on page 151 in the front of our hymnal. We begin our service this morning by singing our opening hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. My apologies, I'm on the wrong page. I even said what page we were on. Let's try this again, shall we? If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your 
present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We say together our introit. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring my soul out of trouble. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness, answer me. In your righteousness, enter not into judgment with your servant. For no one living is righteous before you. Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love, for in you I trust. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring my soul out of trouble. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord, you granted your prophet strength to resist the temptations of the devil and courage to proclaim repentance. Give us pure hearts and minds to follow your Son faithfully, even into suffering and death. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.
Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from Amos chapter 7. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in His hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, and eat bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is the temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 1 and will also serve as the text for this morning's message. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who he has blessed who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us, in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he sent, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of His glory. This is the word of the Lord. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, He is Elijah. And others said, He is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had, sent, who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. 
For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. At this time, I now invite the children to come forward for a children's message. Good morning. So, today in the Gospel reading, we heard about how all of the things that Jesus was doing was being talked about by a lot of people. As a, have you ever heard a, a story from someone that um, may have become popular, and so you heard about it from someone who heard about it from someone? Maybe? You'll find out soon enough. (laughs) But some of the things that that you know, you heard from your friends or from your parents, right? You learned certain things. Well, that's how word about Jesus got around. People were telling each other about all the things that Jesus was doing, about how he was telling people about God and how he was healing so many people. And that was a very good thing. But there were some people who didn't like hearing about Jesus. They didn't like about the things that Jesus said or the things that his followers had said. So they tried to stop them. But we know about Jesus today, don't we? Because they couldn't stop everyone from talking about him. And that's a very good thing, right? Do you think that we should help carry on that tradition, help teaching other people about Jesus, that for so many years people knew about Jesus and told their friends, and their friends told their friends. Can you share the story of Jesus with your friends? Yeah? Do you think that we could pray about that? Yeah? Let's fold our hands and bow our heads. Dear Jesus, thank you for saving me and help me to share your story with others. Amen. All right, before you go back to your seat, would you like a piece of candy? Please. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. We sing our sermon hymn. <laughs>
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The epistle reading this morning reminded me of a story I had once read about about a seminary professor, and it's one story I think I may have shared with some of you before. One morning, this seminary professor and his wife were on vacation in Tennessee, and they stopped for breakfast at a small restaurant, and they were hoping for a nice, warm, and quiet meal as they finished waking up and planning out what they would do throughout the day. And the vacation couple got their orders in to the waitress, and they noticed a distinguished-looking white-haired man going from table to table, sitting and talking with the guests. And the professor groaned under his breath to his wife, saying, I really hope that he doesn't come over here. And sure enough, a couple minutes later, their hope of having a quiet meal alone was shattered as the well-dressed, white-haired man came by their table and said in a friendly voice, Howdy, where are you folks from? And the seminary professor said, Oklahoma. And the white-haired man smiled and said, Well, great to have you here in Tennessee. What do you do for a living? And the seminary professor started to get annoyed, but he said, I, I teach at a seminary. He said, Oh, so you teach preachers how to preach. Boy, do I got a story for you. And just like that, the white-haired man pulled up a chair sat down at the vacationing couple's table, and as he did, the professor just groaned and thought to himself, great, just what I need, another preacher story. And the white-haired man pointed out the window that they were sitting next to and said, do you see that mountain over there? Not far from the base of that mountain, there was a boy who was born to a mother who wasn't married. He had a hard time growing up because everywhere he went, people would ask him the same question. Hey boy, who's your daddy? He never knew and it hurt him to hear it. That little boy would hide at recess and lunchtime to avoid the other students and he avoided going into stores because the question hurt him so much. When the boy was about 12 years old, a new preacher came to his church and the boy would always come in late and leave early to avoid hearing the question. But one Sunday morning, the preacher said the benediction so fast that the boy didn't have time to slip out early and had to leave with everyone else at the same time. And as the boy came out, the preacher put his hand on his shoulder and sincerely asked him, Son, Who's your daddy? And everyone went silent. Everyone in the church had been curious about it. They thought that maybe they would finally hear who the boy's father was. But the preacher sensed the situation around him and said, Wait a moment. I know who you are. I see the family resemblance now. You're a child of God. And the preacher smiled at him and said, Boy, you have a great inheritance. Go and claim it. And the boy smiled for the first time in a very long time. He was never the same again. From then on, whenever anyone would ask him the question, Who's your daddy? He'd say, I'm a child of God. The white-haired man got up from the table and said, Wasn't that a great story? And as he turned to leave, he said, You know, if that preacher hadn't told me I was one of God's children, I probably would have never amounted to anything. And as the man left, the seminary professor and his wife were stunned. The professor called the waitress over and asked her, Do you know who that man was who was just sitting at our table? And she smiled and said, oh, everybody knows him. That's Ben Hooper, the former governor of Tennessee. In our epistle reading this morning, the Apostle Paul writes to the Gentile Christians in Ephesus. 
he reminds the Christians there and us of who we are and whose we are. At the beginning of this letter, Paul proclaims that Christians have been adopted by God through Jesus Christ. Paul explains this in more detail in chapter 11 of Romans using some gardening illustrations. Paul explains that we're like a branch of an olive tree. The tree is like how creation used to be before the fall. Everything was perfect until Adam and Eve disobeyed God and sinned in the Garden of Eden. When they did, everything changed. Sin entered the world. Death entered the world, and God's wonderful creation became corrupted. From then on, everyone has been born into sin, into a sinful world. Sin separated Adam and Eve from God, and it separates us from him today, too. Because God takes sin seriously. He can't bear the sight of it. This separation is so profound that we often have trouble trying to comprehend the gravity of the situation. The sin we were born with, the sins that we keep committing, they would forever keep us apart from our God. We as people, as part of God's creation, have been cut off from him. Our branch on the olive tree of creation has been cut off. Fortunately for us, though, our branch hasn't been abandoned to wither and die. We have been brought into a new tree, one that is perfect. We have been grafted into the tree of Jesus Christ so that we can have new life through him. This is our adoption. We have been chosen by God to be his children. This isn't from anything that we have done or ever could do. God chose us not because of our own merit, but because of Christ's. Jesus, God's own Son, the only one who was ever truly without sin, became sin for the sake of us all. When Jesus hung on the cross at Calvary, He took the sins of everyone from all time on himself. He made of himself a sacrifice, a living sacrifice, so that through his body and blood we would be redeemed, our sins forgiven. Because of Jesus, we are holy and blameless in God's sight. This is why we are children of God. Because of God's great mercy and because of Christ's death and resurrection, we too have been brought into God's family and we share in a wonderful inheritance. This inheritance that we have been promised is eternal life. When Jesus rose from the dead, he destroyed death's grasp so that death wouldn't be the end. We have been promised a resurrection like his through our baptism. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 6 that in baptism our old selves have been drowned. Our sinful natures have been drowned. But not only that, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. As Christians, you have all been adopted by our great and merciful God. He chose you to share in his son's inheritance, an inheritance that one day all of you will claim because of Jesus Christ an inheritance of eternal life in the new creation to come. Like that governor from Tennessee, 
Take pride and joy in knowing that you too are a child of God. That you have been redeemed of your sins. And that you have the inheritance of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in the true faith of Christ Jesus, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. We now make profession of our Christian faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. Please rise. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body. In our prayers this morning, after each petition that ends with, Lord, in your mercy, we respond with, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Preserve your church, O Lord, for your name's sake. Answer us in your righteousness and in all your faithfulness. Since you have sent us forth in this world to testify your word, let us find conviction and confidence in our confession, and salvation is found in the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ alone. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of the church, we commend to you our synod's president, our district president, our circuit visitor, and all ministers of your word. Grant them wisdom in their work and joy in their calling, and make them zealous and faithful. Continue to send laborers into your harvest, so that through their service your kingdom would grow. Lord, in your mercy, preserve your blessed estate of marriage, O Lord. Let chastity be prized among your Christians and honored also in the world. Bind husband and wife together in love and forgiveness. Equip them by your spirit with every good gift to care for each other and to teach their children what you give. Lord, in your mercy. You, O Lord, are king over all the earth. Spare our nation and its leaders. Let the conduct of our civil servants and of our people be wise, just, and honorable in accord with your will. We also ask that you would bless and protect our police officers, firefighters, disaster relief workers, medical personnel, and members of our armed forces, especially Valerie Hosteller and Hank Peening. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, give comfort peace, strength, and healing to all who suffer in heart, mind, body, or soul. Hear us as we especially pray for Carter and Xander Herzl, Joseph May, Lois Upton, Aaron Peening, Tara Gall, Ken Burkhart, Angela's father, Ron Stone, and friend, Hannah, for continued recovery for Rodney Bronzroth, for Krista's friend, Nancy Nevis, and for Mike's brother, Stephen Burr. Lord, in your mercy... O Lord, Heavenly Father, join these our prayers and praises with those of your faithful people in every time and in every place. Unite them in ceaseless petitions of our great High Priest until he comes again on the last day. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. At this time, we now collect our offerings.
Please rise. We pray as Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. You may be seated.
Again, good morning and welcome to all in worship today with us.